Welcome to Tuesday's service in Holy Week. I'd like to remind you that God is with us, as he is with us always. Heading towards Jerusalem, an incredible risky thing for Jesus to do, and in the eyes of his disciples, it must have seemed as the height of foolishness. Was Jesus tempted with every step to turn back? Was he ever tempted to believe, like the servant described by Isaiah, that he had laboured in vain, that he had spent himself for nothing? His humanity surely points to him experiencing deep feelings of agony and anguish, but his confidence in the faithfulness and empowerment of God exceeded his human limitations. Like the psalmist, it is through his hope and trust in God that he finds the strength he needs. Let us pray. Lord God, the message of the cross is difficult to take. How can death give way to life? How can weakness be strength? Yet your word says that Jesus, being God, took on human flesh and suffered the worst kind of death. How can this be? This message is indeed difficult to take. But your foolishness is wiser than our wisdom. Your weakness is greater than our strength. Help us to know that none of us can boast before you. It is only in Christ Jesus that we can boast. In his name we ask you to help our unbelief. That we may love you and walk in the way Jesus taught us. In his name. Amen. I'd like to invite Ben to come and do the reading for today. Thank you, Ben. Luke 20, 9 to 19. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers and went out for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty handed. He sent still a third and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ben, for that reading. I'd like to invite the Reverend Johnson McCotty up to do the sermon for Tuesday's Holy Week service. Thank you, Johnson. Good morning to you, everyone. We just want to thank God that we are here and we are able to worship God even during this coronavirus. And we want to thank God for that because in other places we may not have the technology that we have, may not be able to do what we are doing. So we want to thank God for that. And I just want to say this morning from the reading of this morning, Luke chapter 20, verses 9 to 19, I've come up with a theme, On the Road to the Cross. On the Road to the Cross. There is something I want to talk about it. Some people never grasp a new thing. They simply don't know what to do when confronted with a new idea, concept or invention they've never been exposed to before. So this may have been one of Jesus' main problems with the people of his day. Some people do not know what to do with a new things or a new ideas, new invention, new happenings, until someone comes along with enough patience to explain to them. I've been even following uh, during this coronavirus on the TV. Uh, in other places, they are saying the mes- uh, surgical masks 
are good. In other places, they're discouraging them. In other places, they're saying, okay, do it. So there is a bit of confusion because something new has come to the people and they were not prepared for such a thing. And you can see that people, when they are confronted with such a thing, they are in a panic mode. Jesus went around doing something of the same thing for people. We are limited in our understanding of who God is and how God relates to us. And some people in Jesus' time had some pretty crazy ideas. They had trouble grasping who God is. So Jesus went through doing a lot of teaching, preaching, and showing. He did a lot of healing and said, look here is what God is all about. Helping the poor, the blind, the lame, the leper. Jesus went around playing with children and said, look here, this is what God is all about. Unless you have the faith and love and trust of these little people, you can't grasp real well who I am. So he went around talking to widows, prostitutes, cheese, tax collectors, and said, look here, God loves you and cares about you. You are an important person because you too are one of my children. This is an unusual thing Jesus is doing. And Jesus went around telling stories about sons who take up their inheritance and go out and blow it on wine, women and so on, and ending up slopping the pigs and going home to a father who waited and celebrated his return. He told stories about lost sheep and a shepherd who risked life and lived to find them. Because people had trouble grasping who God is, and how God deals with people. They had to be shown and told in many ways over and over again for them to understand what Jesus was saying. Because God is so great and our understanding is so limited our ex by our experiences and past, our ideas about God are always in need of expansion. For we'll never be able to fully comprehend the greatness of God. And that is what is happening in our lives. But that's why we are here. That's why we are able to listen to what I'm saying. To hear again the story of how God loves us. To try to grasp some more of God's greatness. To struggle to understand how God deals with you and me. With our lives and how then we are to relate to those around us. And this is why we need to understand who God is. And so Jesus told stories, parables, played with children, prayed with mourners, talked to adulterers, healed the sick to show, to demonstrate, and to explain, to live out a way of life he called the kingdom of God. And by so doing, we grasp something about who God is for us, which is quite different. Take for example, the gospel lesson for today, the parable of the tenants in the vineyard. In the account of the story, three servants were sent by the absentee owner of a particular vineyard to collect the rent from the tenants he left in charge. And that is what you see here. It is a simple story, somewhat gruesome in its detail, but it tells us something about God. These three servants were beaten and thrown out, so the landowner decided to send his own son. The son gets killed as well. Let's stop right there. What's this point? The story doesn't make much sense when you look at it. Why would anyone in his right mind after having sent three servants in a row, all of whom get beaten, why would any loving father send his son after seeing what had happened before? The landowner must be an ass. We can't grasp the point very well because it's sheer foolishness. It's total foolishness in us. And yet, and yet, even though it doesn't make sense, the son goes on and gets predictably killed. Think about it. Why? Even though it doesn't make much sense, the God of creation who sent prophets to Israel and watched them be stoned for trying to show and tell people a better way. Even though it doesn't make much sense, this same God sent his son and he got predictably killed. And that is what we see here. And we still sit and shake our heads and don't get it. Why would God do such a foolish thing? Because God loves us, his people, his creation, so much that God will take the risk 
of sending his only son. That's what Jesus is saying in this parable. And it doesn't make sense to the listeners. And it's hard to grasp. But God loves us to the point of risking his son. God loves us to the point of a cross. God loves us to the point of calling his, sending his only son to die for us. Even though it doesn't make much sense. God takes a risk on you and me. In the middle of our impatience with our children, God still loves us. In the middle of our making fun of classmates, or ridiculing a friend behind your back, or gossiping about a neighbor, God still loves us. That is one thing we need to know, that God still loves us. In the center of our sin, even as we kill his son over and over again through our own acts of hatred, pride, jealousy, and arrogance, God still loves us. Tell me, does that make any sense to you? God loves us. God loves us. And so, Jesus told us a story, a very foolish, illogical story about God's love and God's risk and God's action in sending his son, Jesus, the Christ. Why would God take such a foolish risk? I can't comprehend it at all. My rationale, my small mind can't totally understand how and why God operates the way God does. We may not understand how God operates. But it is has something to do with God's profound love for creation. And specifically for you and me. How else can we explain that God accepts us even while we are sinners? How else can we explain that God forgives me over and over again and over again for the same thing that I know I've done and well I shouldn't but just can't help myself but God still forgives me. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? God surely must love us because he puts us in his vineyard for his and gives us the freedom to work at it. Even gives us the freedom to harm his messengers and each other by acts of hatred and violence. And yet God sent his son in love for you and me. What a perfect, illogical, irrational, profound thing to do. When we think about it, we see how God does. So what is our response? Take that parable apart anyway, the way you want it. And we are the tenants in the finals. And what are we to do? To turn the place, to bear fruit, to care for each other, to thank the owner with the fruits of our labor. And that is what God expects us to do. Even though we aren't as faithful as we should be. Even though we are to kill God's messenger. With our lack of love, respect for one another. Even though we often want no part of the work of this vineyard. God still loves us. God still loves us. Someday. I know someday. Perhaps the impact and the profoundness of God's grace and love and forgiveness will move us in the depths of our being to live the new life he offers for us. I say someday. Maybe this day. God is saying something to us. God is saying something to the church of today. God is saying something to say, no matter how much you have sinned, Jesus has come to die for you. No matter how much you have done anything, no matter how sinful you are, God is here to forgive your sins. He's going to the cross to die for you and me. And God loves you. That's why he has to send his only son so that he can die for you and me. And we are here because of him. So this morning, I'm just saying to you, think, reflect upon who you are in your relationship to God and come before you asking for forgiveness because we are all sinners only saved by the grace of God. May the good Lord help us this morning in our understanding that only God can save us. Only God can save us. God bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, let us pray. Let us pray um, to ask God's love for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for all who give of themselves sacrificially, for those whose lives are dedicated to saving others, the doctors, the nurses, 
the firefighters, the soldiers, the police, the parents, the carers, foster carers, those caring for children and elder relatives. Father, we pray for them. We pray for those serving in, in different places that have been savaged by this coronavirus around the world. The medics, those who work in missions, the media, the NGOs, and the charities who bring food and shelter, healing in those in need. Sometimes putting their lives on the front line, putting their lives in danger. Father, we pray for them. We pray for those in our communities who need our unconditional love. Those hurting from broken relationships, abuse, bullying, domestic violence, children and adults whose lives are at stake because of the coronavirus. Father, we pray that you continue to help and save us. We pray that we might be Easter people, laying down our lives to save others, bringing hope to the hopeless situation. The hope of the cross and the resurrection should be guiding us. Thank you, Father. I pray for the leaders in the Uniting Church that they continue to be guided by the Holy Spirit as they lead this church to another level. I pray for Atherton Uniting Church, Father, Lord Jesus Christ, that once at least they are being logged in those places where they are, they should never forget that God is in control and is in charge. Be with us, Father. Bless us. In your name I pray. Amen. Bless you through the Holy Easter week. In Jesus' name, Amen.